Charles Haddon Spurgeon was perhaps, well, many say the greatest Baptist preacher who ever lived was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I heard about a preacher ask his wife one morning at breakfast, how many really great preachers do you think there are? She said, I don't know, but probably one less than you think there is. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a great preacher. Nobody would argue with that. And he had a preacher school. And they called Spurgeon the governor. Governor is what they called him. And uh, they, they had preachers who would stand up and preach in preaching class. And they had the, the professors who were sitting there listening. And Spurgeon, the governor, was sitting there listening to this boy. And he was the head of the class. He was smart. He was brilliant. He was gifted, erudite. He was facile of speech. He was just the epitome of everything. And he was preaching on this particular passage of Scripture, putting on the whole armor of God. You remember I preached the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and, and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and all of these. And Baxter said, as this young man preached, he said he was putting the armor on with such precision that he said you could almost hear it chink into place as he preached. Just incredible, just gifted. And he, he had done this thing. It was just a, a masterpiece, a homiletical masterpiece. He was doing good and he knew it. Finally, he got on the whole armor of God. He had the shield of faith. He had on the helmet. He had on the boots. He had on the breastplate. He had on the belt. He had it all on. And then with a look of real assurance, he said, And now, where is the enemy? And Spurgeon in a stage whisper said, He's inside the armor. See, that's the flesh. That's the flesh that can sometimes preach. That's the flesh that can sometimes serve on a committee. That's the flesh that can sometimes sing a solo. Sometimes inside the armor. Not the infernal foe, but the internal foe. The flesh. Amalek. Then came Amalek. He wants to keep us out of the land that flows with milk and honey. Now, you see the certainty of our fight. I want you to see the strategy of our foe. I want you to see what Amalek does and how he attacks. First of all, he attacks unexpectedly. You wouldn't expect him at this particular juncture. You see, when did he attack? After they'd come through the Red Sea. After they had eaten manna. God fed them with manna from heaven. Supernaturally, that manna pictured also the Lord Jesus Christ. And after they had drunk water from the rock, you'd think they'd be sailing along right now. I'm going to tell you something, friend. Amalek attacks unexpectedly. And many times, your biggest battles will come after your biggest blessings. You just study it in the Bible. Elijah, when he had that revival on Mount Carmel, remember when he called down fire from heaven and, and he said, the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And the fire fell and all of that. And then the first thing you know that, that uh, Elijah, who stood against 450 prophets on Carmel, he's running from one woman, Jezebel, and he gets down under a juniper tree and requests for himself that he might die. I mean, right after a great spiritual battle. Uh, you find the same thing about Moses after he had come through the Red Sea, requested for himself that he might die. Jonah, after Jonah had been through a revival in Nineveh, requested for himself that he might die. There's a principle that I would just almost call the devil after the dove. When Jesus Christ was anointed with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit like a dove descended upon him, that's depicted in our baptistry there, that dove coming down, then in the next chapter, the Bible says that he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The devil after the dove. And here are these people. They've just had an incredible spiritual experience. They have just drunk water from that rock. But the Bible says that the flesh lusts against the Spirit. And if that water represents the Holy Spirit, then Amalek represents the flesh. It was Leonard Ravenhill who said, when God opens the windows of heaven to bless us, the devil will open the doors of hell to blast us. And so it happened at a place called Rephidim. Rephidim, which literally means 
a place of rest, a place of support. I mean, here they are. Everything looks good. So what should that tell me? It should tell me always to be alert. Jesus warned us. The apostles warned us to be alert, be sober, be vigilant. Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. But not only does he attack us unexpectedly, but I tell you, he attacks indirectly. Now you're in Exodus. Just turn to Deuteronomy chapter 25. And here again, Moses is recounting this story that we find in Exodus 17. You see, God won't let Amalek off the hook. Remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt? God says, do you remember this? How he met thee by the way, now watch this, and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Talk about holding a grudge. Man, listen, God says, don't forget this guy Amalek. And, and notice here what he says about Amalek. You see, not only did he attack unexpectedly, but he attacked indirectly. What it was was a sneak attack from behind. He smote the hindmost of thee. That is, with those that were weak and those that were feeble and those... He didn't attack the strong. Now, the devil will not attack you at your strongest point. He'll attack you at your weakest point. That's where you're going to go down in the flesh. The only problem is that your weakest point may be what you think is your strongest point. Oswald Chambers said an unguarded strength is a double weakness. But the devil knows where that weakness is. And the flesh goes to that weakness. And so, have you ever done anything and said, I'm surprised at myself? <laughs> I'm, I'm really surprised. Have you ever asked yourself, what made me do that? Have you ever done that? Of course. I am surprised at myself. I'll tell you one thing, God wasn't surprised. Jesus is not surprised. He knew man and needed not that any should testify what was in man. There is in you and in me something down there given the right thing in an unguarded moment to come to the surface and you'll say and do things, you'll say, oh, I am surprised. I could. Have you ever done that? What made me do that? Well, you see, what happens is that Amalek, he attacks unexpectedly when you think everything's going fine. He attacks indirectly. You see, God tests us at our strongest place. The flesh tempts us at our weakest place. Here were these wounded and weak and weary on the one hand, and yet after a great spiritual experience on the other hand, a sitting duck. And not only that, but he attacks us arrogantly. Notice again, look at it here in verse 18. I'm in Deuteronomy 25, verse 18. He feared not God. The Bible says the flesh is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. The flesh has no desire for God, and God has no pity on the flesh. All right, now, I've talked to you about the certainty of the fight. I've talked to you about the strategy of the foe. Now I want to talk to you about the victory of our faith. I want to show you how to get victory over the flesh. Now, turn back again to Exodus chapter 17 where we began, beginning in verse 9. Here's God's plan. And remember, this is God's picture book. It's only an illustration. We could find these same truths taught in the New Testament, but somehow reading an illustration helps us to understand sometimes in a better way. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass that when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands 
one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now that's the way the victory was won. Moses goes up on the mountaintop and he takes a rod and he holds the rod in the air. Now there's something going on up on the mountaintop and there's something going on down in the valley. And when this man holds up his hands, the battle seems to go for Israel. But when the man lets down his hands, the battle seems to go for Amalek. Well, the rod that Moses had in his hand represents the power of God. Remember how God gave Moses that? Moses had to throw that rod on the ground and get the serpent out of it. And then he took it up. No longer is it called the rod of Moses. It's now called the rod of God. It was with that rod that he opened up the Red Sea. With that rod that he went through Jordan. It was that rod that struck that rock and water came out. That rod represents the authority, the power of God. And my dear friend, that's the only thing that overcomes Amalek, the power of God. The power of God represented by that rod, nothing else. It was the rod that led them out of bondage, out of barrenness. It was the rod that led them into battle. Now, that's the power of God. And that's the only thing that the flesh will knuckle under to is the power of God. Not your good intentions, not your resolutions, not your promises, not your habits, nothing else but the power of God. And so the power of God has to be made available. Now, how is the power of God made available? Through prayer. Through prayer. When Moses was on the mountaintop, just holding up that rod, what he is saying symbolically is, dear God, the battle in the valley is being won up here. What happens in the valley is dependent upon your power. Now, there were two who helped Moses to hold up his hands, Aaron and Hur. I looked up the meaning of the name Aaron, and it means light. And her means white. And what it speaks to me of is purity and revelation, holiness, her, revelation, Aaron. And her in the Bible is associated with the holiness of God also. Aaron is a priest associated with intercession. Here on one side is, is intercession, and on the other side is purity, holding up the hands of Moses, who holds in his hand the rod of God. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that all of this is highly symbolical. But all of this is telling us in, in language, if we would see it, that the victory over the flesh is always God-given. God-given. You'll never win this battle by resolution, resolve, habitual practices of whatever. That which is flesh is flesh. The victory over the flesh is God-given. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how do you overcome the flesh? Well, you don't fight a battle already lost. What you do is stand in the victory already won. Galatians 5, 16, walk in the Spirit. Ye will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I'll tell you something that's been a blessing to me and in my prayer life. You know, I've known for a long time uh, that I don't have to obey the devil. I've known that. Sometimes I do, but I don't have to. I mean, it's, it's easy for me to rebuke Satan. Say, Satan, look, I'm not going to argue with you. I don't shout at you. I don't beg you. I don't plead with you. I don't reason with you. I bring Jesus Christ. I bring the blood against you. I bring the spirit against you. I resist you and I rebuke you. And Lord Jesus, in your name, I stand against Satan. And I've done that. You do that. 
But you know, I don't do that enough about the flesh. I try to handle the flesh. I just try to do better. Have you been guilty of the same thing? Just try to do better. What I have to learn and what you have to learn, dear friend, is that God has a perpetual war with the flesh. And victory over the flesh is not won in the valley. Oh, there was a battle going down there and you're going to have to do certain things. But the victory was won on the mountaintop. That's where it's won. And you don't have to obey the flesh anymore and you have to obey the devil. Amen? Amen. Father, seal this truth to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.